Before we begin, I must remind you what I said in the first episode on this subject, in the first dose of the divorce vaccine, that I know nothing about vaccines. I know nothing about immunology. I don't know anything about COVID. This was not part of my comprehensive rabbinic training. But the premise of this subject is that there's a different epidemic, the divorce epidemic, that is preventable with a vaccine, or at least it provides 95% protection. And the goal is to outline the divorce vaccine and how to make sure that we protect our marriages. Now, like we said last time, there are a few caveats here. Number one, like any vaccine, we cannot guarantee 100% efficacy. We'll try to get to 95, 98, something like that. In addition, like any vaccine, this is going to require a little bit of pain. There's a jab, and the jab is going to sting. But the objective is that the sting of the jab is infinitely less painful than the disease that it is preventing. In the previous dose, we talked about dating. We talked about how to select a suitable spouse. And in the present dose, in the second dose, we will be outlining how to establish an enduring marriage, how to make a marriage that is built to last. What is the nature of the foundation of an amazing marriage? And again, like a vaccine, we're going to exchange some short-term pain for long-term happiness, long-term joy, love, and blissful harmony. The Talmud tells us that a bad marriage is more bitter than death, but nothing tops an amazing marriage. Marriage can either be a delight unmatched by any other, or it can be a Jobian torment more bitter than death. That's the disease that we want to remedy with this vaccine. But as I mentioned, the remedy entails some pain. And we're going to outline that pain, the pain of the vaccine. But I want to remind you that divorce or even a bad marriage is much worse pain. So essentially, the premise is that we're going to present a choice. Which pain do you prefer? The good and productive pain, the pain that results in a ama- in the pain that results in an amazing marriage, or do you want the senseless and damaging and spiralingly and spiralingly progressively worse pain that results in a failed marriage or in divorce? Those are the options. So let's explain. I want to start off with the with the very basics. You know, what is marriage? What is the purpose of marriage? What is the reason to have this institution of marriage? What's the essence of this union, of this bond? What's it all about? I think that our understanding of this critical part of life has been shaped by Hollywood and Disney. And that's one of the major reasons why this whole system is going awry. You fall in love. You want to know true love. I had someone tell me recently, I don't know if this is the person that I can marry. I just, I just don't feel butterflies in my stomach. I'm thinking like, is there any other decision that you would make in life that you would try to consider the volume of butterflies in your stomach as being something which is an indicator of it being a good idea or a bad idea? So part of our discussion today is an attempt to deprogram some of the harmful misinformation and disinformation that Western society has been imbibing about marriage. Our talk, our vaccine, is going to be very realistic. Not romantic, not starry-eyed, 
not hopeful, not grounded in fantasy. In fact, our first goal is to try to shatter the rosy fantasies that we subliminally absorb from our culture. You notice we started off by saying, there's lots of pain in this jab and you have to choose which pain you want. There's the minor pain or the temporary pain and you wanna avoid the harsher pain. What about uh, romance? What about love? We don't present a very romantic picture, but I think that this is very useful if we want to have a realistic picture of what this institution is all about, it's very useful to try to shed the childish, the fanciful, but ultimately harmful attitudes of marriage. Indeed, as we progress through the vaccine, we'll see how marriage can be incredibly deeply meaningful, deeply enjoyable and pleasurable in an amazing way, it can result, like the Talmud says, in, in the best experience possible. We're going to get to the romance and the love, but this is something that we have to work towards. We have to build towards. We have to invest towards. Only with hard work can you arrive at that goal. So let's explore this question. Very basic. What's marriage? What's it all about? Why am I contending that to do it right demands some degree of pain? Where's the pain? What is this institution all about? So, of course, as is true with everything, the place where we find answers is in the Torah. The first marriage is the marriage of Adam and Eve. And if we examine their union, we find all the answers to our questions. What's marriage all about? What are the challenges? Where are the hiccups? If you study the story of Adam and Eve, you find some amazing things. Before the union of Adam and Eve, we discover that man was alone. And then we have the assessment of God of man's situation. Chapter 2, verse 18 of Genesis. Vayomer Hashem Elohim, and God said, Lo tov hios ha'adam levado. It's not good for man to be alone. Let me make him a helper. Let me make him a mate. It was not good for man to be alone. When man's alone, things are off. Man is incomplete. So what did God do? He got Adam to sleep. And he extracts one of his ribs. We know the story. And he fashions Eve out of that. And then we have Adam's reaction. Verse 23. Vayomer ha'adam. And Adam said, this time, zosapam, etzim atzamai. It is a bone from my bone. It is flesh from my flesh. This woman is called Isha because she was taken from man from an ish. And the Torah then proceeds to give us advice. Al Cain, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, Vidavak Bishan shall cleave to his wife, Vihayu Lebasar Echadish become one flesh. In this exchange, in this narrative, we discover something incredibly deep, profound, and life changing. Adam was alone. The Talmud tells us that he was despondent. He was melancholic. And God fashioned Eve for him. And then he was happy. But if you study the nature of this development, you'll find something very unusual. How did God produce Eve? So we're told, put Adam to sleep, take one of his ribs. God took part of Adam and used that to make Eve. Eve was literally a part of Adam. And Adam acknowledged that in his declaration. He's so happy. Again, this is the 
very first description that we have of marriage. This is bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. This is a part of me. And the Torah then narrates, therefore, meaning now that we have a formula of what such a union looks like, we too, the descendants of Adam, should follow his example. And we get very specific and precisely phrased instructions. Okay, therefore, man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and become one flesh. What does this mean? How do husband and wife become one flesh? So Rashi tells us that, well, if you have the father and you have the mother and they produce the child, the child is one flesh, but it's a hybrid of mom and dad. And that's what it means. You should leave your parents, start your own family, and have children. That's how Rashi interprets it. But there's an amazing and very instructive Ramban. He says, what does it mean that man shall cleave to his wife? So he tells us, the animals. In the animal kingdom, this concept does not exist. There is no cleaving of husband and wife, of male and female. Animals do not cleave to their spouses. Rather, they have relationships. They mate. There's no cleaning. It's just polyamorous relationships with whomever. But Adam is now changing the nature of this union for humanity. Because she was bone from his bone and flesh from his flesh, she was not some sort of outsider that he met. Oh, you meet this lovely woman, you fall in love. That's not how it happened. She was literally part of him. And he sensed that. And therefore he had this magnetic connection specifically to her. She was part of him. And therefore he clung to her. And he desired to always be with her. And that changed humanity. Humanity diverged from the rest of the animals. The rest of the animals mate. But humans seek more than just a mate. They seek someone that they can unite with, to cling to. And this got implanted, says the Ramban, in the DNA of Adam's descendants to abandon their father and mother and to find someone that they can become one flesh with, one indivisible unit with. You have to abandon your parents because your relationship with your wife, with your spouse, is much closer than with your parents. An amazing idea here in the Ramban. Man is unlike the beasts. All the animals are designed to seek mating partners. But for the animals, that's like a transaction, and it's polyamorous. There's no cleaning. Interesting sidebar, the Talmud Shlief tells us that there's one exception. There's one animal, namely the dove, that has one mate per lifetime. And if their mate dies, that's it, they're done. And that's why the Jewish people are compared to the dove, and that's why the dove has all that meaning and symbolism related to it. That's a sidebar from the Talmud. But animals, they don't have this concept of clinging. <coughs> Excuse me. Humanity, on the other hand, is predisposed since the union of Adam and Eve to find more than just a mating partner, to find someone that they can fuse and meld with into one unit. As if there is a part of you, bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh, that is within the other person. So we have a description here of marriage. You start off life and you're an individual. And you have parents and siblings and cousins and friends and acquaintances, associations of all types. But there's a part of you that's missing. And when you find someone that you want to share your life with, you're committing to living your life with this person as if they are literally part of you. Bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. So we have a description of marriage here. The marital union 
It's taking two people with different genders and different backgrounds and different families and different attitudes on a great many things, different temperaments and different idiosyncrasies and eccentricities, innumerable differences in every area of life, taking those two people and fusing these opposites into one. This is an incredible insight into the core definition of marriage. Marriage, by the Torah's definition, is taking two ostensibly disparate and distinct entities and forging them into one, welding them together as one so that they should become one flesh. Now let's elaborate on this a bit further. What does it mean to fuse two into one? What does this entail? What are the challenges of doing this? And as always, we'll start with the principles and proceed to the practical applications. The first thing that this entails is that you have to leave. You have to abandon. You have to leave your father and mother. Again, the verse frames marriage as the rejection, not the rejection, but the abandonment, the departure of one identity. You should leave your father and mother and you should adopt a new one. Abandon your father and mother and cleave to your spouse and become one. The first requirement here is to abandon your father and mother. What does that mean? It means that you have to abandon your previous identity. In order to forge a new identity, the disparate parts have to divest, dissociate, discard, and abandon their previous identity. You were a child, and you had a father or mother, and that kind of formed your identity. But that's really a a half-identity or a, a half identity. And you have to abandon that in order to forge, to develop a new one. When we talk about the pain of this vaccine and the trade-off, this is what we're talking about. You have to make a choice to walk away from a previous identity, to dismantle a previous identity, and to build and and foster and forge a new one. This could be very frustrating. This could be very painful. Since you were a kid, your whole world, your whole universe has been you. We start off life as completely selfish entities. I always made the joke that little babies never wake up in the middle of the night to tend to their crying moms. It doesn't happen like that. Everyone starts off as being selfish. And you sense your, your own pain and pleasure, but not that of the other. Your identity is you. The Talmud, in fact, not the Talmud, the Torah, in fact, defines a single person as someone who comes with the edge of their clothing. Meaning, their entire universe ends where their clothing ends. You're alone. It's just you and your world. And you know what? The longer that you are single, the more entrenched that half-denity becomes. And now, you have to leave that. You have to abandon that. You have to walk away from that. You have to leave your father and mother to create something new to cleave with someone else, and to forge that into one flesh, into one identity. The essence of marriage, thus, is banishing and dismantling our innate and inborn selfishness. You have to kind of crack yourself open and expand your identity to include someone else. You have to see a different person as yourself. Not a different person, a part of you. Bone for my bone, flesh for my flesh. 
Their successes are my successes. Their failures, well, that hurts me too. Their feelings are important to me. Their agenda matters to me. Their needs are things that I feel as well. Their struggles are my business. This is a whole new way of living. And it's very challenging, even a little painful, especially at the beginning, at the acclimation stage. We are told, we're instructed to break, to shatter our old identity. And there is an interim period before the new identity kicks in. And between those two identities, well, that's the hardest part. We'll talk more about that, please God, soon. Maybe we'll have a whole dedicated podcast on this subject. The acclimation period, the first year of marriage. But this is why it's so difficult. Now, what does this mean on a practical level? What does it mean to change your identity from the half identity that you had when you were a child of your father and mother and fusing now with someone else to forge something new. It changes your whole life. Previously, you were alone. Of course, you had family and friends and coworkers and acquaintances, but ultimately you were alone. And now you are sharing your life with your spouse. Now you're not alone. Everything in your life is now done together with your life partner. That means you have to inform them and everything's happening in your life. You have to tell them everything. Your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your fears. You have to make yourself vulnerable to your spouse. Everything that happens in your life on a day-to-day basis, you have to clue them in on you got to tell them where you're going, when you get back, what happened, who you met, how your day went, what happened, what are the challenges, what are the things that irritated you, what are the things that delighted you. You have a partner. You have to completely open up to them. You have to tell your spouse also about your previous life. Get to know them and have them know you. Everything that happened in your previous life, with the exception of things that will damage your relationship, namely talking about your previous relationships or previous sins, everything besides for that, you have to tell your spouse about. You have to be curious about them. You have to be interested in them as a person, not just as some sort of extension that can help you. You're not alone. You don't just have this occasional sidekick. You, your identity is now expanded. The things that you enjoy, you now enjoy together. Pleasure of all types must be enjoyed together. My grandfather, bless him, used to tell young grooms that before they got married, they'd be walking on the sidewalk, and they'd pass a bakery, and they'd smell the wafting aroma of some some cupcake or some sort of croissant. And they say, you know what? I could really use a croissant or a donut. And they go and buy themselves one. Once you're married, you never buy just one. You always buy two. Why? Because your life is now, your experience it with someone else. You're always thinking about your spouse. Before marriage, your life was about you know pursuing pleasure on your own, avoiding pain on your own, setting your agenda, whatever your agenda is. And now that's all done in tandem. I find it very distasteful when I see married people going on vacation without their spouse. If you are have someone that's bone for my bone, flesh for my flesh, you go with them. Now, of course, occasionally, you know, boys night out, girls night out, that's probably healthy, but you're enjoying life's pleasures together. 
And here's my uh, controversial opinion alert. So if you can't handle controversial opinions, maybe maybe listen with half an ear for the next 30 seconds. So in most shuls, they have they have a kiddish after after davening after prayer. There's there's a kiddish. I'm conscientiously opposed to a kiddish, and here's why. What happens a lot? I see this in our neighborhood. They have like a lavish kiddish after after prayer after davening on Shabbos morning Saturday morning. There's a long prayer, and then you're rewarded with this big kiddish, lavish kiddish. And over the course of the years, the the kiddish and the the array, the smorgasbord, has gotten more more embellished. I think it's bad because what happens, you know, in our shul at least, there's different shuls in the neighborhood. But some of them, they have uh, you know like a men's section and a women's section, uh, and sometimes they open up and they have it all together for the kiddish. Some places not. But regardless, I see people, they're coming and they fill up their plate and it's towering full of food and they're just engorging themselves with food. I'm like, how are you having such a good time without your spouse? And what happens if, you know, you have a Shabbos meal prepared at your house and now you've just stuffed your face with food and you're going to get home and you're all full. What happened to spending Shabbos together as a family? Anyhow, that's why I'm conscientiously opposed to a kiddush. Maybe I should take this out of the podcast because it's very controversial. But this is the idea. You're not alone anymore. Why are you partying by yourself? Part of what is demanded to have a deeply meaningful relationship is to surrender your independence. You have to give up something in order to become one flesh. The decisions that you make, the choices that you make, it's not just about what's best for you. It's what's best for you now in your expanded self. You've been fused together as one. That is the definition of marriage. That's the goal. That's what Adam showed us. That's what the Torah outlines and directs us to try to pursue. Now, I think that uh, maybe this is the understatement of the year. Not really all marriages in the world are quite like this. In fact, I surmise very few marriages follow the Torah's advice of recreating your identity, abandoning the previous identity, and adopting the new one. Perhaps many people are not aware even that that's what marriage is supposed to be like. Or maybe they try to become one flesh, but then they encounter the pain that comes with it. They see the size, the intimidating size of the needle of the jab, and they get scared away. And they never actually get to taste the bliss and the sublimity of truly sharing your life with someone else. And the problem with this, maybe this is the problem with everything, the pain is often front-loaded, but the bliss, that romance and love that we talked about, that is back-loaded, and therefore people just give up. And I think most marriages, even the ones that quote-unquote make it, the ones that are success, there's no divorce, they're not quite too distinct people fusing into one. Some people, you know, they have their separate lives, separate bank accounts, separate bedrooms even, separate lives. And they stay together for the kids or for the tax benefits or just due to sheer inertia. And in my opinion, it's a shame. It doesn't have to be like that. We could aspire to something much bigger. I think if you look at the Jewish marriage ceremonies, you see again and again, there's an effort to try to drill this into the young couple. Under the chuppah, under the wedding canopy, 
the bride encircles the groom seven times to symbolize that they are binding these two people as one, into one unit. Under the chuppah as well, there's a special blessing, a special prayer. Sameach tesamach, glad we ask of God to gladden. Re'im ovim, these beloved friends, the way you gladdened your creations in paradise. Meaning, make this couple as happy as Adam and Eve. And then for seven days, the seven days, <coughs> excuse me. And then for seven days, the seven days of the marriage festivities, again and again, we drill this into the young couple. It's a prayer and a blessing, but also an aspiration and even an instruction to the young couple, remember the marriage of Adam and Eve and try to emulate it. Now, was was Adam and Eve's marriage, was it the model union? Didn't they fight? Didn't they blame each other? Didn't Eve give Adam the terrible advice to eat from the tree? And then, then Adam threw Eve under the bus. This is part of the lesson. Their union had some hiccups. All unions have hiccups. But nevertheless, they showed us what this union is really all about. Adam put it the best way. This time, it's bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. This is part of me. And that is what we try to strive for in our marriages, to unify two distinct entities into a single merged identity. You know what? Every marriage has hiccups. Every two people, they have disagreements. There's tension. They may even fight. We have differences of opinion. That's okay. That's okay. Adam and Eve themselves had their fair share. But they're nevertheless the prototype because they symbolize the overarching idea of what it's all about. And this is another part of it. You know, Adam and Eve, how many people were there for them to compare. It was just Adam and Eve, right? There was no uh, neighbors or uh, people on TV. There was no one else that they could compare to. There was guaranteed exclusivity because that's, that's all there is. This is an aspect of what we're trying to strive for. Two people who become one, and that's it. This is you. This is you. You've been fused into one, and this is your partner for life, to the exclusion of everyone else in the world. I remember once hearing something that was so disturbing. There was a, a married man, and he was opining the following disturbing sentiment. He said, even after you make your order at the restaurant, you could still look at the menu. That's what he said. So I, I think it's just a, a terrible thing to say. You know, this guy was like ogling at some women, even though he was married. I think it's so deeply offensive for a few reasons. First of all, marriage is not like ordering something from the restaurant. It's finding a, a partner for your life. It's finding a life partner. But also, like, how is he following the Adam and Eve model when you're still shopping around? I uh, often think what happened to him and his marriage. I don't know, but uh, if I had to guess, it's not exactly thriving. Now, we're going to be talking more about uh, this aspect of marriage and avoiding the pitfalls of non-exclusivity, please God, hopefully we'll do an episode titled Social Distancing. Maybe we'll do it. But the, the overarching idea I'm trying to convey here is what's the foundation? What's the basis? Adam and Eve showed us two people who become one. Whatever you want out of life, you desire that for your spouse. 
You pray for yourself, pray for your spouse. I've told people in the past that there's a special prayer that we say at the end of the Amidah that has your name in it. You read a verse that has your name in it. Say two verses, your name and your spouse's name. After all, you're one flesh, you're one person. Fuse into one. Another point. You are closer with your spouse than anyone else. I've seen this. Maybe everyone's seen this. It's really disturbing to me. You never chat with someone else about your spouse as if you're closer with them than with your spouse. And never, ever, ever joke or laugh at your spouse or a spouse's expense with other people. The person in the world that you're closest with. This is, this is your bone from your bone. This is you. It's your spouse. Never joke with others about them. And in general, I think it's very helpful to banish cynicism about marriage. You see this a lot. And it, to me, it's really, really disturbing. You know, people make these knowing comments. Oh, they roll their eyes. Oh, women. Or, or men, I assume, that the women do the same, or maybe, I don't know. But it's a really terrible thing. There are these, like, silly jokes and, and memes, and it seems like it's just, you know, harmless banter, but I think it's, it's really destructive. It's really destructive. People make stereotypes. I, I had this story. I actually looked it up today. Someone sent me a, a meme. This is someone I don't really know. We could call him an acquaintance, okay? He's an acquaintance. I don't know, we're not friends. And I looked up on my phone just to make sure that I have this accurately. On November 18th of 2021, so a couple of months ago, at 1.18 a.m., I knew it was 1 a.m., but I had that in my notes because I said I got to talk about this. But I actually looked it up. It was 1.18 a.m. He sent me a message on WhatsApp. It was like a, like a silly meme. I said, I can't believe this guy sending me this meme. You know what a meme is, right? Everyone knows what a meme is. So this meme was three pictures. The top picture had a mouse trap with like a piece of cheese ready to spring. And the next picture was like a, like a bear trap or like an animal foot trap. You know, it has these claws that snap shut when someone stands in the middle of the, of the trap. And then there was like a, an engagement ring presented like nicely in a box. And then the caption said, well, it's the same idea with just a different design. I think these kinds of jokes are just horrendously destructive. Now he, you will be absolutely shocked to learn, is divorced. And I was thinking, you know, he's living by himself, sending people that he barely knows silly memes at 1 a.m. What does that tell us about him? So this is something that is very, very destructive. You never joke with someone else or even discuss your spouse with someone else. Again, if there's a therapist involved, different story. But just among friends, never, ever, ever discuss your wife, your husband with your friends or laugh about them in any way it's very, very destructive. And again, as we progress through the vaccine, we'll talk more about uh, the things to avoid. Now, in our society, the stigma of divorce has softened, not just in our society, in every society. Is this, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? So I think it's a good thing for the divorcees it's good for them to not be ostracized as pariahs, as perhaps was true in the past. But it does lower the social cost you have to pay to get divorced. The Talmud tells us something really interesting. This is going to lead us into our next subject, next talk, next episode on this subject. The Talmud tells us, that the, the, that the marriage concept or the marriage contract, that the marriage contract 
the Ksuba was designed with a very specific purpose. A Jewish marriage has a, has a contract, and the contract details the responsibilities, primarily of the husband, to the wife in their marriage, and the consequences of annulling one way or the other this union. What is the purpose of a tsupa? What is the purpose of this marital contract? Which, by the way, interestingly, is like the oldest continually used contract. The Talmud talks about the contract, and you go to a Jewish wedding today, it's the exact same words of the Talmud. The same contract is still in effect. The same promulgated form, so to speak. What is the purpose of a tsupa? Says the Talmud to make divorce difficult and painful. You see these billboards, you know, thousand dollar divorces, easy, painless. Even I know you guys know my uh, my opinion on on prenups. Every every financial guy will tell you, well, it's a good idea. It may be a good idea financially. It's a bad idea maritally. Why? Every single marriage will run into trouble. Even the best marriages will likely start off as being very rocky. The acclimation period is never easy. Like we said, you have one identity, you have to shatter that to create a new one. And then there's this whole period in between where you're kind of, you're not quite settled in into your new identity and you don't have that comfort of your old identity. It's very difficult there are inevitably going to be problems. Like we said, Adam and Eve, they fought a lot, they bickered a lot, but so what? They're still the model. So divorce, what's that? That's when it's just the the marriage is untenable, is unfixable. And it's, it's something that we believe in. You know, there's a whole book of Talmud about divorce. But the objective has to be to separate the things that should end up in divorce, the really problematic unions from the ones that could be great if they understand what to do and if they're willing to put in the effort. And therefore, it's important to raise the difficulty of escape to provide an incentive to work on it. Every marriage runs into trouble. That's inevitable. I once heard a wise sage saying that every single couple at one point in their marriage are convinced that they married the wrong person. Now, I don't know if it's actually every every single couple or this is maybe reassuring to people to hear that this is normal, but maybe it's like 95% of couples or a huge percentage of, of couples. I don't know. But... Great marriages have problems. And you're supposed to work through it. And you're supposed to absorb some of this pain. And you're supposed to be aware of what it entails. And know what you're getting yourself into. And navigate those waves. That's what you're signing up for. You're signing up for some pain. If you know that ahead of time, and the, the cost of escape is really high, hopefully you'll put in the hard work, you'll absorb some of that pain, and you'll end up with an amazing marriage. If you happen to, unfortunately, marry someone who's abusive or controlling or an axe murderer, dangerous, manipulative, someone who's deeply flawed in some unusual way, listen, we're all flawed, but some people are just not capable of being a good spouse. We understand that. And that's why the Torah, you know, has the carve out for divorce. If it does happen, it's a tragedy, but that's okay. But in most cases where people get divorced, it does not have to happen. And the only reason why it happens and lives are torn asunder is because the parties involved were not inoculated. And we're trying to change that. And we're trying to change that with the divorce vaccine. And 
In this episode, we learned about what the union is really supposed to look like. Man and woman are designed to complete each other. Man is incomplete alone. Woman is incomplete alone. Fused together, one plus one equals one. It's bad math, but it's good marriages. To do that requires a lot of work. You have to forfeit your individualized identity and merge and meld and fuse into one, into one flesh. It demands a fair degree of sacrifice. It's a process that inevitably hits bombs, hits obstacles. It's painful. And there is an acclimation period. The Torah tells us for a minimum of a year, it's a different period. It's a period of acclimation. This is the period of laying down the foundation. When you lay down a foundation, it's all hard work. And there's no benefit of the edifice. You want to live in a house. What's the foundation doing for you? You try to build a house without a foundation, it's going to collapse. But when you're building foundation, it's just hard work with no appreciable benefit. And that's the first year of marriage. That's the acclimation period. That's the shattering of the previous identity, but not quite settling into the new identity of, of two people becoming one flesh. And therefore, as is true with many things, the pain is all front-loaded, and the pleasure, and the bliss and the harmony, and the romance, and the love, well, that's all backloaded. Spousal love is the experience of sharing your life with someone amazing, with someone beautiful. But it's earned over time. The work, and the commitment, and the pain are front-loaded. The love, and the deep pleasure of having a life partner well, that grows over time. Alone, we're incomplete. Alone, our potential is capped. The Talmud tells us something very severe. This is found in the book of Yavamos on page 62b on the bottom, going into 63a on the top. Call Adam, every man or every person that does not have a spouse, does not have joy does not have blessing, does not have goodness, does not have Torah, does not have a homo, which means like a, like a wall of defense. And finally, the Talmud makes the shocking statement, every person that does not have a spouse is actually not a person. Meaning, you are a person, of course, and you can be happy and joyous and have blessing, but you're a half identity. You're half a person. You're not a full person. When united together with a spouse, our potential in every area, bracha, blessing, simcha, joy, tova, goodness, even Torah, it's expanded a thousandfold. Without a spouse, we are so incomplete that it can be justifiably said about us that we're actually not a person. We're a half a person. We're a potential for a person. But we're not quite a completed entity. This is the foundation of an amazing marriage. The foundation of an amazing marriage was taught to us by Adam and Eve. Take two different people and fuse them together Bone for my bone, flesh for my flesh. Take two people. Each one of them has to forfeit something, give up something, abandon something, and then they fuse into one, become one flesh. But of course, there is still a lot more to discuss. We want to talk about love. We want to talk about this acclimation period. We want to spend some time talking about the best practices of marriage. We want to talk about the potential pitfalls that we have to avoid. We want to discuss how the Torah designs marital life so that things stay fresh, so that things don't get stale, how to maintain the spark. There is still a lot to cover.
We have more boosters that we need to talk about. Maybe an antibodies test. Maybe a social distancing podcast. And I want to tell you that in the previous dose, I said we have to, you know, wait four weeks for the antibodies to kick in. It was like three months ago, so I apologize for that. No one's perfect, but I hope, please God, to once again do another episode on this subject soon. Till then, I hope you have an amazing marriage. Hope you, if you don't have a spouse, you find one, and you have love and joy and blessing in your life. As always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.